I'm going to uh, introduce the first session on the medical care provider's perspective. Um, our speaker in that panel is Dr. Stephen Shu. He is an assistant professor of dermatology, biomedical engineering, and, and pediatrics at the Northwestern um, Medicine Feinberg School of Medicine, uh, and the medical director of the Center of Biointegrated Electronics. He is a physician engineer and experienced developer of wearable technologies with a focus on maternal, fetal, and neonatal health. Dr. Shu has authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and listed as inventor on 11 pending and granted patents. His research in medical devices has appeared in Science, Nature, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and the New England Journal of Medicine. He's a co-founder and CEO of several spin-outs, including Sonica Health and Cybel Health. Um, you can find out more about uh, Dr. Shu's uh, accomplishments in the bio um, that is um, accompanying our website. Dr. Shu. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. So uh, I'm going to jump right in and, um, you know, I just want to give a big shout out to, to Shayla and the BARDA and NAC team. It's really been a pleasure and honor to, to work with you all. And, um, you know, it's certainly informed our work and, and uh, really pushed forward our technology and, and really appreciate Sandeep's point about the future wearables. I'm, I'm a true believer, and I think it has a lot of opportunity to transform health uh, across the entire spectrum of hair care. So um, I come to this talk with kind of two hats, well, maybe three. The first and foremost is as a doctor. So I see patients um, still, I see them once a week, um, all ranges of life from young, healthy people uh, to older adults struggling with multiple chronic diseases. Um, I have a perspective as an engineer uh, looking at technology and how it solves unmet clinical needs. And then I have a third hat as an entrepreneur you know, one that uh, is developing and, you know, taking these technologies through things like the FDA and commercialization. So I'll, I'll try to sort of, you know, color and, and, and provide perspective across all three kind of aspects and, and kind of share with you our journey, our perspectives, um, and, and sort of, you know, have a, a centroid focus on COVID-19, which is really kind of a, a huge driver of interest in this technology when it comes to that, but not exclusively so, Okay. So um, just to introduce our institute, I think it's a very unique institute. Um, it's actually founded by one of the leading academic engineers in the world, his name is John Rogers. Uh, I serve as the medical director and I get to basically do my dream job, which is take really amazing engineering science, um, you know, developed by some of the leading you know, engineering thought leaders in the world and applying it to uh, unmet clinical needs in the hospital, both pediatric, rehab, adult, remote, whatever you, you, you wanna uh, call it, and then allow that really to lead to things that solve problems. And uh, uh, sort of our singular focus is really around bioelectronics, sort of devices that you know, are broadly bucketed as a wearable, but really sort of bridge the gap between um, you know medical device and uh, biology, so we're kind of excited about that future where everything is getting digitized. Now, I want to make a point that we love to collaborate. I mean, this is something that we, we do you know frequently, both at the university as well as our spinouts. But I just wanted to make a point that the NIH, um, BARDA, and DOD um, are really centroid to our ability to do the high risk, high reward work in medical devices that um, is really essential. So I just wanna give a shout out to you know, federal agencies, federal funding, uh, which has been a profoundly important aspect of, of what we do. And, and so, so thank you for that. So uh, we've launched devices, so I am conflicted. I have uh, you know, commercial interest in, in many of these products, um, but I think it's important uh, from the perspective of me as a doctor to also so kind of have that color that we've actually launched devices out in the world. So kind of seen them real hand, read customer reviews, so really understand you know, what it means to wear a wearable and, and, and have that feedback. Um, so back in 2020, um, kind of at the summer kind of peak, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about wearables and COVID-19. Uh, we were very fortunate to actually be featured. That's the Atom device that uh, BARDA has supported. Um, and it's the only one that's kind of on the thorax area measuring respiratory symptoms. So I think we, we did pretty good. And there's Aura Ring and Fitbit and Apple. And I think COVID-19 has really shone a spotlight on wearables, what they do and the opportunity and what happened. And, and it, was, it was cool to see that. Um, I'm going to sort of focus in a little bit more on, on wearables from a medical perspective and, and what's going on in this activity space. Sonica and Cyborg are the companies that I've co-founded with, with 
with John and others um, and, and, and have a conflict there, but I just want to make that clear. But there's a lot of groups looking at this from consumer electronics to medical device companies and everywhere in between, uh, many of which have been supported by BARDA. So there's a lot of activity in this space. And then ultimately what you see is there's a, there's a wide variety, right? You have watches, you have rings, and then you have patches. Patches is what we do. And all of them have distinct advantages, disadvantages, and interests in terms of what sort of applies and works for patients. And I kind of go through that and unpack it with you guys over the next 20, 30 minutes. So our work is very centroid on creating clinical grade measurements, those that sort of recapitulate gold standard monitoring platforms that you will see in a hospital, ICU, et cetera. And those were sort of, you know, paired, uh, published just February and March at Nature Biomedical Engineering and Nature Medicine around two platforms that I will talk about today. Um, but this is sort of areas where we think the future is moving in terms of wearables, where, um, you know, Apple says the future of health is on your wrist. I would politely disagree. I think, um, you know, the future of wearables is really where the best possible data comes from on your body. The wrist is the best place. It's sort of a convenient place for electronics. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity and innovation that's still happening with on-body wearables. That is not a wristwatch, although I own an Apple watch and I like it very much. Um, my, my first medical perspective is that wearables is not winner take all. I don't think there's going to be you know, no offense to Aura, a single ring to rule them all, right? There, there is going to be different devices, different tools, different sensors, whether that's a wristwatch, a ring, a patch, um, that's going to fit that patient where they are, fit the care setting, whether that's ICU, home, ambulatory, transition to home, parameters of interest, whether that's vital signs, novel digital biomarkers, what feeds into AI machine learning algorithms. Let's not forget the importance of patient reported outcomes, how well they feel, how sick they feel, whether they just feel off. That's really important information that may, may not be capturable you know, by a wearable. And then also the importance of the ability to think about the use case. Are we trying to do early diagnosis? Are we trying to do triage? Are we trying to do recovery monitoring? Um, all those things affect what wearable you ultimately pick. So I think there's a lot of applicability. It's not winner take all. There's a place for really all these medical devices within an ecosystem. And I think that that's a really key perspective is that you know, for some patients, they will never wear a patch. They will just never do it. And that's okay. You know, that's not something they are willing to do, interested in doing. They wouldn't be adherent to it. For some, they will only wear a watch or a ring. And for some, they wouldn't do anything at all. So I think there's a lot of ways for us to look at it from a, from a, from a medical standpoint is that you got to meet patients where they are. And, and it's not a winner take all sort of uh, solution. So I'm going to try to break things down into three like key buckets in terms of what I think wearables need to kind of do and do well in order to impact value in terms of, in terms of healthcare with an eye towards COVID-19. And the first is we got to measure what matters, right? So you got to go where the symptoms are, right? If you're measuring a respiratory or cardiopulmonary disease, measure those parameters. Uh, if you're measuring a disease that's focused on you know, blood sugar regulation, obviously go to where, you know, blood, blood glucose is, um, you know, if it's in pregnancy, it's something different. Is it mental health? It's something different. So you got to measure what matters and, and sort of be able to identify the symptoms that really connect biologically to the disease and disease state you want to look at. So sounds pretty obvious, but I think important to, to kind of remember, you got to measure it well, you know, I think that that's important. I think, you know, things like heart rate are, are, are relatively straightforward to kind of do, you know, I think a lot of devices can measure heart rate accurately, but I think there's still really unmet needs around things like respiratory rate. I think it's actually a very difficult vital signs parameter to kind of measure well and continuously. It's something that we have grappled with and dove into. So I think there are a lot of even traditional vital signs that are difficult to do. Like not that many technologies can do that well. Um, there's a lot of things that can measure blood pressure from a point measurement standpoint, but very few that can do it continuously. There's only an isolated few that can do that. Um, and, and so measuring it well is important. If you're gonna pick things to, ma to measure, measure them at that clinical grade whenever you can uh, to adapt to that. And the last thing is adapt to the patient. I think Sandeep made a great point that most individuals uh, in the America own a smartphone, um, but that's less than 50%. If you look at uh, older adults above the age of 60. And it gets even lower when you look at ages 70 and above and 80 and above. And a lot of those individuals are the, are the ones that cost the most to the healthcare society. So adapting to the patient is really critically important. Something that I think, um, you know, being on the front
front lines has, has been very informative for me, kind of understanding that. And I think ultimately doing all those three things, doing that really well is, is a tall order. It's difficult. And that, but that's where I think ultimately the solutions are going to come from. So let's go into measure what matters. So um, I want to pick older adults because it's an area of focus for one of our companies called Sonica. And I think for individuals that are older adults, measuring things like heart rate and physical activity, although there's usefulness there, there's definitely utility, it misses things that actually matter a lot to older adults, things like swallowing problems, social isolation and loneliness, respiratory issues. And so I think it's important to kind of think about that in terms of measuring what matters. And, you know, one of our devices that we've invented and developed called the Atom Sensor actually, you know, leverages soft mechanics and also unique mounting locations like the super subtle notch, and then really advanced battery life, you know, up to seven days on a single wireless charge. The device is actually rechargeable, which is actually an important point because that reduces the cost per day of monitoring. That really captures things that really matters in the context of older adults. So, um, this location is interesting. So we talked about wrist, you know, as a convenient place for mounting electronics, but not always the best place to get data. Um, we are very gung ho about the super sternal notch location, right where your clavicles meet at the base of your neck. So much information flows through that two by two centimeter, you know, area of real estate, um, speech, talking, body position, cardiopulmonary signs like respiration, heart rate, respiratory sounds, cough count. So it's really an area that we can leverage and exploit because we have a soft, flexible device that can actually be mounted there in a comfortable way. Um, so one of the areas that we're measuring that matters for older adults is something called dysphagia or trouble swallowing. There's more than 10 million older adults with this problem. Um, this dysfunction is incredibly prevalent in nursing homes, in um, LTCs, um, and it also leads to serious sequelae like aspiration, pneumonia, death, a lot of pneumonias that can occur happen from aspirations, swallowing problems in older adults with dementia and Parkinson's disease. And this is an area where traditional wearables really haven't looked at, right? You can't measure swallowing from a wristwatch, that's for sure. Um, but the ability to maybe track this and measure this has an opportunity to deliver healthcare outcomes and benefits um, for a specific use case and population. And so this device, when mounted here, can actually track the mechanoacoustic signals of when you swallow. We can not only to tell when you swallow or not, but we actually can get a sense of what you're swallowing, if it's water or honey or saliva or Greek yogurt or meat. And then we can also track things like coughing after. So if you kind of aspirate, we can track that continuously. It's an example of measuring something that, that matters in the context of older adults. Uh, we actually have gone on to actually add biofeedback, you know, thinking about wearables in the future. Personally, I love data, right? As an engineer, I think it's valuable. But as a physician, I love data but I prefer therapy, right? I want my patients to get better. And sometimes presenting data does that, but we're also interested in how we make it therapeutic. So actually vibrating to remind you to swallow more as a biofeedback rehab at home. So these are the ways that our, our perspective is changing. These are the ways that I'm looking at wearables, not only as monitoring tools, but potentially therapeutic as well. And I think, you know, CGMs are a great example because it's paired with things like insulin dosing, et cetera. But we're trying to think about that from a biophysical way as well. I think that's kind of an exciting area to, to kind of consider. Um, we know that we're in kind of a loneliness epidemic. COVID-19 has not made that better. In fact, it has exacerbated the situation. Nearly half of elderly, uh, older adults feel lonely. Um, it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, just, just that morbidity, mortality of being socially isolated. Um, and that's something that's been talked about, you know, in the context of COVID-19. But I will say that in terms of like loneliness monitoring, we can actually track how much you're speaking with our sensor mounted right here. And it does not do that with a microphone. You know, there's a lot of devices that can listen into what you're saying. There's privacy concerns there. But we only measure when your vocal cords vibrate. And I think that's kind of unique because it doesn't create privacy concerns, less computational power, lower power monitoring. So we're actually just tracking how often you're speaking. And that's very relevant for older adults adults who might be socially isolated. If they are watching TV, a microphone may not be able to pick that up or understand that that person is actually isolated, but just watching TV. We only measure when you generate sort of vocalization. So I think there's a uniqueness there. We're looking at vocal biomarkers and that work has just been uh, supported by the federal government. So it's an, another example of measuring what matters. And in the context of older adults, swallowing and loneliness and these kind of things are, are really kind of important. And that aspect, you know, you know, creates a new opportunity for wearables to do things beyond 
heart rate and physical activity. Uh, in the context of COVID, we're, we're really proud and, and, and I really deeply enjoyed all the interactions I've had with ENACT and, and BARDA around this effort to kind of repurpose the earlier project to focus on COVID-19. I think we're really, really successful in that regard, you know, leading to multiple manuscripts, interactions with the FDA, uh, technology hardening, uh, FDA uh, submission. So these are all things that really have been enabled by the support that we've gotten from BARDA and, and, and really appreciate that. Um, we talk about COVID-19 in this context, you know, in, in a science advances at a we published just last year, but you know, COVID as a predominant respiratory disease, you know, measure these things that really matter. So, you know, shortness of breath is listed twice here, not as a, a typo, but shortness of breath is more than just respiratory rate. So we actually can track respiratory rate in the context of physical activity. So we can track how much you're active, and then we can look at how much your respiratory rate responds to that almost kind of a continuous stress test. And that is shown to be really valuable in our internal algorithms to kind of assess and predict COVID-19 infection. With the mounting of this location, we actually can track coughing. So when you're actually generating cough, which is really powerful because in the context of COVID-19, cough is one of the most common symptoms. And there's a lot of great work out of MIT and our group as well, looking at cough as an underutilized biomarker, different coughing from viral infections versus bacterial infections. We can actually kind of deconstruct that cough signal with our sensor continuously and look at what it looks like. Is it long? Is it dry? Is it wet? So a lot of things to unpack. Our sensor can capture that in a continuous wearable way without a microphone. So you'll never miss a cough essentially with our technology. A lot of that is sort of illustrated there. What we also found is that that measurement was actually quite useful to our uh, nurses. Remember in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, PPE, including the hospital that I worked at, were in really, really short supply didn't have that many N95 masks and gowns. And so one of the things that were really useful to our nurses and doctors was to know which COVID patients were super coughers. We actually had you know, certain patients that coughed hundreds of times per hour and some that only did 10 or 20. And that translates actually to aerosolization risk. We went ahead and actually showed that in this paper where the amount of coughing, the intensity of that coughing um, actually predicts to how much you know droplets you actually produce. So that was sort of a useful piece of information, like what room am I walking into? Should I double check my PPE? You know, those kind of things were kind of collateral benefits that we saw you know, with these kind of wearable technologies that do unique things beyond heart rate and physical activity. Uh, we have another sort of technology group. It's sort of a, a, an advanced patch. It's actually a dual patch system that really tries to recapitulate the ICU, allowing for rechargeable, reusable measurements at ICU grade quality. What I mean by that is the same sampling rate, the same resolution, the same amount of information you get from a Philips or GE or Draeger monitor you get from these patches. It also happens to work with your smartphone. So, you know, trying to measure what matters is really important because in severe COVID, you need SpO2. You want to have an assessment of continuous blood pressure, as well as, you know, traditional measurements like heart rate and respiratory rate. Okay, so we talked about measuring what matters. So thinking about the use case, thinking about the disease state, thinking about the symptoms you actually want to measure, um, this is kind of important to highlight, you know, heart rate and activity ultimately become somewhat of blunt instruments, right? There is more important value in, in other digital biomarkers. So measuring that is important. But then when you are able to measure it, you got to prove that you can measure it well. You know, so this is a kind of a demo of what we're doing. And you know, essentially, it shows the ability for us to kind of capture continuous vital time in a real time streaming manner. And that's really important for things like telecritical care, remote monitoring context where you need to have waveforms, not just numbers, not store forward, but continuous streaming and data. So that's sort of an illustration of measuring things well and providing that information for doctors, nurses, even in a fully remote manner to be able to deliver and access care. So one of the things I just kind of wanted to show was, you know, he's, he's, he's going to be coughing excuse me, and you can see that signal on the white graph on the bottom and our cough counter going up as, as, as it's tracking cough. But then it's also not susceptible to laughing or talking. So that's machine learning algorithms that we've implemented that a lot, a lot of supported by BARDA um, that allows us to kind of track that digital biomarker without being confused uh, against confounders. Um, now, this is all kind of more work that's done, you know, confusion matrices, sensitivity, specificity, you know, AUCs. These are things that really need to be reported, put out there in the world, uh, not just like a trust me. I think that's really important as we're sort of moving toward new digital biomarkers and, and help. Um, you know, I think FDA has great guidances around performance, right? What are what we expect from a heart rate monitor, a respiratory rate monitor, SpO2, so there's well-established guidances. I think those things are very important for wearable companies to be transparent, open about, you know, are we meeting what the criteria are established through well-established guidances in order to do that? I mean, as, as, as us as a group 
they're very committed to that performing at that level. Um, you know, again, you know, using another example, we do work in pregnancy. That's something of, of strong interest of ours, you know, high quality waveforms demonstrating performance against gold standard systems that are used in the hospital, and then illustrating that use case across different populations. So measure what matters and then prove that you're measuring it well at the gold standard level. So I want to just kind of finish um, adapting to the patient. I want to leave time, obviously, for questions. Um, you know, C. Everett Koop is a hero of mine, kind of in medical school. I always kind of loved, you know, you know his sort of demeanor. His very famous quote is, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. So I kind of like commandeered it. Wearables don't work in patients who don't wear them, right? So, you know, ultimately, I think that that's a really important point, that human aspect. You know, I have patients that have 13 medicines, COPD, oxygen tanks, um, heart failure, you know, asking them to, you know, do certain things, download an app on their iTunes thing, is, it's, it's a bridge too far. And so ultimately, when we think about technology, they really have to adapt to the patient. You know, we at our companies, we actually incorporated actually non wearables, because, you know, in terms of getting data in the home, getting it and making it useful, sometimes what a patient can do is only a point measure. Sometimes what they can do, you know, extends beyond setting up a watch, these kind of things. So we have to be cognizant of that, that kind of um, use case. You know, I mentioned older adults, like even though smartphone use has gone up everywhere, there's still a large proportion of older adults that don't own one and let alone know what their iTunes login is. So we actually conducted a, a fully virtual trial. It's actually kind of fun supported by the NIH, NIA uh, via ANOSI for COVID-19. And we did 25 subjects, so not a huge amount, but we shipped them any patches. We train nursing home staff fully virtually. This is a time where all nursing homes were locked down. Devices were applied. We monitored vitals for two weeks, a quarantine period. So we had 90% you know, successful data capture, no skin events. The average age of participants was 84. We had a 96-year-old participate. So I think it illustrates the importance of getting in there. Right, adapting to patients, training, all those things are really essential to the use of, of a device, the quality of the data. And I kind of, as a medical provider, really think these kind of examples are super important to demonstrate in that population. Um, I'll touch base on machine learning. Um, you know, if you talk about machine learning to AI to a physician, like 99% of the chances they will have, will have no idea what you're really kind of mean by machine learning. Um, I, I think that I have strong enthusiasm for what it can offer, but a muted sort of conservatism of where we are today with it. So I think that I'm a kind of a realist, realistic optimist. So um, I think there's great emerging work. And a lot of it's in COVID. So this is from the Fitbit group. And day zero is important because that's where you sort of see, um, you know, initial symptoms reported by patients with COVID-19 wearing a Fitbit band. And you can see that up to four days before, you see sort of separation of vital signs, right, for respiration rate, heart rate, these kind of things that illustrate a change, right, that may be illustrative of an impending infection. And I think that's really exciting work. You know, I think there's more to do. We need massive, larger RCTs, uh, clinical trials. We need to distinguish from other sort of things things like other infections, you know, maybe, uh, um, you know, poor sleep the night before. There's a lot of things that can maybe trigger this, but these are emerging evidence that this is kind of interesting. This is work out of the MIT uh, group around looking at COVID-19 uh, recordings of cough and amazing results, 100% sensitivity for asymptomatic COVID-19. So you know, there's a really exciting flashes, but I think a lot of work needs to be done to validate, to reconfirm, to generalize some of these things. We too are working on this, you know, support from US military and BARDA, uh, MTech specifically. We developed our own algorithms using all the vitals that we collect with our patches to identify early COVID-19 infection. And, and that is, um, you know, the, the trial's done. We're sort of finishing up our final kind of, um, you know, manuscript and, and hopefully be able to share that more broadly very, very soon around our performance to do very similar things to the Fitbit group and MIT, which is to use vital signs as a prediction tool for early COVID-19. But to kind of make it sort of, you know, clear, I, I don't think wearables are going to replace molecular diagnostics. As a physician, I trust PCR, I trust, you know, antibodies, ELISAs. That's just going to be a, a closer ground truth to infection. Like, I, I don't think wearables will ever replace a flu test, a code. COVID-19 says, I don't think they ever really should. Um, but I do think there's opportunities for wearables when deployed in remote monitoring in several use case contexts to prevent exposures, to maybe warn you to get a test where you otherwise wouldn't be tested and to support medical decision-making. So I think I'm, I'm enthusiastic about wearables, but I'm also you know, respectful of what it can and cannot do. And so that's where I think there's a sort of line to be drawn there. 
So ultimately, my perspective is, you know, measure what matters, measure it well, adapt to the patient. And the sort of push in innovation is better form factors that are more and more visible and more capabilities. I think that we're reaching sort of an acceleration. I'm really excited to see where the field goes. So i um, happy to take any questions or comments or clarification at this time. So over to you, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Shu. Um, what an amazing presentation and a lot of things to think about. And we do have some questions in our um, chat box. Um, let me just start off with one question asking about, um, has there been any um, testing of your devices in transport environments, such as an ambulance or interfacility? You know, how does movement and all these other activities affect oh. the accuracy of the wearable? Yeah, so we actually had an opportunity maybe a year and a half ago to go down to Fort Sam Houston with uh, Army Air Medics, and that was a lot of fun because they were doing simulations and helicopter transports. We're testing transmission of the wireless signal through a helicopter. Um, so these patches are really unique because they're soft and flexible, and they allow us to couple to the skin much more intimately. So there's more inherent motion resistance. There's less wires tugging at it, things like that. So um, that's something that's kind of a unique advantage. Also sweating, you know, sweat resistance is an area mm -hmm. that we work very hard on. And that's a lot of its advanced adhesives that kind of wick away or absorb sweat without affecting the signal processing. So in terms of untethering, yes, absolutely. You know, it's one thing measuring patients at home, sleeping quietly in climate controlled mm -hmm. conditions. But we've done military, we've done low middle income countries with no air conditioning while women were giving birth. We've done firefighters doing exercises. So those are other use cases that I think wearables have a really unique ability to make a difference because you're just not going to be able to lug a GE monitor across the, the table there. Yeah. So uh, there was an earlier question about sort of merging environmental sensors with wearables to possibly you know, do studies and look, maybe look at correlations between environmental pollutions and disease. Have you guys, yeah. ha, has that been in development or do you know much about that? Yeah, I, I know our group kind of, um, you know, worked, we have a UV sensor that we've launched and, and, you know, that's obviously related to ultraviolet radiation and skin cancer. So that's more of an environmental sensor. I know there's groups like Plume that are doing air pollution and microenvironment. Um, I know there's a lot of apps that also look at UV index and air pollution. So I, I think absolutely there is there is an opportunity to link what's happening in your micro environment with a external facing wearable versus what's happening mm -hmm. to you physiologically. I think certain areas like, for instance, Dr. Wong, like asthma, that's a really, mm -hmm. really good area where you know, external monitoring plus an on-body sensor to leverage right. new opportunities, COPD as well, you know, mm -hmm. maybe for things like CHF, maybe a little bit less important, but um, certainly, absolutely, I think there's opportunities. We, we've dabbled in the space, but we, we like to look more internally in the body than externally, but a lot of opportunities for sure. Great. Um, so you had mentioned briefly um, blood pressure monitoring, and we have a question about how close are you, are we to continuous medical grade um, blood pressure monitoring? Gosh, it's a great question because it's sort of like the holy grail of wearables. And I, I think there's been some good work in this space. Like, you know, Sotero Wireless is a company that actually does have FDA, you know, clearance for continuous blood pressure monitoring via pulse survival time. Uh, BioBeat is another company with a watch and a chest patch. I think a very innovative group out of Israel. Um, so, so there are, um, and I think there's a, there's a company that just recently got CE market, starts with an A, it's a wristwatch as well. The name escapes me, but I think there's semblances of promise in that area. Um, as a clinician, as a, as a medical provider, I, I love the idea. I think it, it would be really useful. We, we kind of do a similar metric, although we don't have FDA clearance for that. Um, but I think there's things that still plague it, right? Like calibration remains like a big sort of thing that you have to continuously do, update, you know, you need continuous, you know, calibration with a traditional, you know, spiegel manometer. And that sort of, you know, maybe limits or mutes the, the true wearability and use of it, because then people say, why not just use a, a wireless wearable blood pressure cuff? Um, there are wristwatches that do kind of inflate, like Amon has that. So, you know, I, I, I say there's, there's good semblances of work there, but I, I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of continuous I think there's going to be resistance to like an implantable blood pressure, which would you know go right into an arterial tree. Um, in terms of my prediction of the future, probably over the next five, 10 years, we'll have improvements in the technology where non-invasive BP will be more standard, but um, it's a measurement that's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. people have tried for 20, 30 years 
And there's still sort of issues that I haven't seen quite solved yet. So anyway, I, I am hopeful, but I'm not think, I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay. Well, here's a question that I have um, as well as one of the attendees. Um, so for the adhesive patches, uh, what is the possibility for long-term use? And of course, yeah. I've um, also wondered what, uh, you know, what do you do with patients who say I'm allergic to this adhesive or that adhesive? And is that, you're a dermatologist. Um, yeah. What's your perspective on that? Um, again, it's adapting to the patient, right? Like uh, we spent a tremendous amount of time perfecting our adhesive. It's like kind of like probably the most important innovation that we've done that we never talk about. Um, you know, remember we do work in the premature uh, infants and for, for NICU and, and, and these kind of things with the Gates Foundation. So skin safety and skin tolerance is a big part of, you know, what makes our group unique. And then soft, flexible sensors that kind of mechanically map the skin naturally also allow you to get away with adhesives that aren't super aggressive and strong. So, you know, again, like C. Everett Coop, like wearables don't work in patients that don't wear them. If you have an allergy or a resistance to the adhesive or it's too irritating, you're going to stop, right? So I think that that's a really important area of innovation that goes far beyond the hardware, the tech, mm -hmm. the software, the AI. It's like, does it compatible with your skin? As a skin doctor myself, I think the skin is a really amazing shell, organ, you know, mm -hmm. these kind of things. But it's not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not nails, it's not bone, right? It, it's it's mm -hmm. sensitive and it has these kind of things. So I, I think that's really, really important. I think the other side of it you're asking is around adherence. So, you know, it's funny because when 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 um you know cell phones first came on the scene late 80s and 90s, like a lot of people were like, never gonna happen. No one's gonna own a <laughs> cell phone. And like this is ridiculous, you know. And I think the same thing with like smartwatches. When they first came on, I was like, oh, that's silly. I have a smartphone. Why do I need a smartwatch? And, I got my smartwatch. <laughs> yeah. and, but I, you know, I think ultimately history is going to, you know, you know, favor these wearables that are on body because that's where the data is. That's where the value clinically is. That's where, you know, when you come in for a hospitalization or God forbid, whatever, you know, they're putting ECG patches on your chest, right? They're measuring your respiratory rate from your mouth. You know, they're measuring SpO2 from your fingertips. So you know, those are things that are important, right? Those are important to realize. And, and so there's going to be an evolution. There's going to be a market trend. Does that happen next year, five years, 10 years? That's harder to predict. But ultimately, I think that's where we're going to end up. I really believe in the future, all of us are going to have a smartphone and a patch that we wear that delivers really meaningful information for us. Great. Um, we'd have a question here about the role of... Um, health support workers, like social workers to yeah. help with using and interacting with the smartphones and apps. And I think this is particularly true for the elderly. I know you gave the example of, you know, the nursing home, but there are a lot of elderly who are living at home and increasingly that's going to be the case. They probably struggle more than others with trying to, um, you know, use these devices and they also are the ones that we want to reach out to more because they are living on their own and taking care of yeah. themselves. 100%. I mean, I have a strong interest in, in kind of the care of older adults. You know, I, I have a, a grandmother that's 93 years old, you know, and wow. I think that ultimately I, I, I need to call her more. But I also think that, um, you know, older adults are an area where they, you know, impart a lot of healthcare costs. They can benefit the most from these technologies, but they have the lowest technology literacy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's just so important for wearables and, and companies to not, you know, sit in an engineering, you know, boardroom and say, oh, right. we've got the best solution. Like, go into the nursing home, go into an older adult's, you know, home and, and just sort of see the challenges that, that face them. And so I think that like understanding that human element is so super essential. Like, you know, for instance, I'll, I'll give you a tidbit. You know, we colored our sensors to be kind of skin colored to kind of blend in. And one of the strongest feedback we got from older adults is that they hated it. They hated the color because it made it look like they had a tumor on their neck. And so, you know, we, we made it a very striking color that became a conversation piece. And, and these things are kind of important. I, I also profoundly agree with you that as a doctor, we're one of the we're one of the worst adopters of new technology, right? We're resistant. We're concerned about medical legal. We're concerned about, you know, how much we're getting paid, how we're getting reimbursed. Like, I mean, these are real things that, you know, doctors like me think about, like whether subconsciously or, or overtly. And when it comes to like RPM and wearables, I think I see a few questions about like, what are doctors going to do with the data? That's a tremendous effort, right? That's a tremendous, like changing physician behavior. Like, gosh, that's a whole other thing. And so when you're saying like, 
well, how do we leverage community health workers, social workers, dietitians, um, educators? I mean, they're going to be the people that really are going to be able to make that data useful, but also be mm -hmm. more conducive to seeing it and making a difference. So 100%, I think that we need to leverage more healthcare providers that are not MDs, right? Mm -hmm. that, that really can make a benefit because MDs oftentimes are not equipped to deal with all that data, not equipped to interpret it, not incentivized to deal with it. We got to think about unique payment models and new opportunities where we can and, you know, leverage other healthcare professionals. Like you don't need an MD looking at your blood pressure every week. You just don't, right? I think there's mm -hmm. opportunities for us to expand the, the spectrum of care that really leverages others. And, and those that are, are, are in the community that have people's trust, you know, these are things that are really, really important that are human aspects that are completely separate than, than what your device does. Right. So we do have a couple of questions about payment. Um, what do you know, or has there been any experience with payment policies regarding these wearables? And yeah. um, also questions about sort of the, um, you know, the security of the data that you're collecting. I mean, you're getting a lot of data and, you know, the use of the data yeah. for AI or, you know, yeah. whatever analysis and then the security of that data. I guess they're, yeah, they're sure. probably, I believe we have a session on data security. So, you know, um, we may talk more about that in that session. Yeah, I think data security is, is you know, really, really important. Cybersecurity is a big hot topic at the FDA. You know, I, I think like just for us, for instance, there are good industry standards around that encryption of the Bluetooth, you know, mobile, you know, wiping of, of, of mobile devices whenever that's possible or, or whenever that's needed you know, HIPAA compliant, high trust certified cloud and, you know, big, big cloud companies like Azure, Google, you know, AWS, we use AWS, you know, have a lot of built in tools for security. So, you know, I would say that it is expensive. It is important. Um, it does require expertise is becoming more important, but there, there are sort of structures and frameworks in place to follow SOC 2, for instance. So those things are, are, are there. Um, you know, I, I think it's just something that's that 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 is becoming a barrier. You know, for I think a lot of wearables and new tech companies, where you know, gosh, making a piece of hardware that's great is hard enough, right? Then making software, then making it all secure. I mean, it, it is becoming a challenge because of how important and valuable that data is. So, have you um, had any experience with the payment policies or issues? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, one of our biggest partners is a major uh, payer in the United States, one of, okay. one of the largest. And, you know, I, I think overall, there, there, there's sort of two, two big trends. The first is, you know, the, the, the telehealth CPT codes around RPM has really driven a strong interest in this broader area and this technology. Whether that's going to translate to a consumer wearable, I, I probably don't think so. You need kind of devices that are more, you know, FDA clear, you know, gone through that process. There's sort of hybrids, right? Like Fitbit and Apple Watch that have FDA clearance for certain things uh, via the de novo pathway. But, but I, I think that, you know, th those CBT codes are very helpful, Dr. Wong, because now there's sort of this process for getting paid to initiate, to use this, to monitor. Monitor. But I think the second is more broadly, right? As we move, you know, slowly towards quality over services, right? Stop doing mm -hmm. fee for service, but, but, but sort of overall capitation. Right. Um, you know, there's incentives to keeping patients out of the hospital, right? Keeping people from, from doing a virtual visit versus an ER visit. I think wearables have a really mm -hmm. strong play there. Um, also transitioning from hospital to home care, hospital at home. I think these are things where wearables, especially technologies like ours that can do continuous monitoring at, at sort of ICU grade, has a real opportunity to make a cost bending thing, not just, you know, you know deliver reimbursement. So you need both, right? You mm -hmm can't just say we're going to save a bunch of costs because you know every doctor's gonna be like show me your rct show me the clinical trial and that's very expensive and time consuming the other is also well here's an opportunity to do more rpm here's a way to get reimbursed for it and we think down the line it's going to lead to lower costs that hasn't been as clearly robustly proven dr wong we need to do a better job just showing that in, in, as, as a group yeah <laughs> So have you um, seen these wearables incorporated into clinical trials and used in clinical trials or, or just even folded into the HR? I mean, like, yeah. is it a seamless mm -hmm. process in which that can happen? EHR integration is definitionally not seamless, but there are... <laughs> You know, there are standards, HLA, Fire 7, you know, we, 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 do, we do work on that, you know, 
Um, and, and it's it's something that is really important. There is processes, but you know, obviously that can always be optimized. Intercompatibility with EHRs is a you know big problem, right? Like then you know it's a lot of legislation around that. But but it's possible, it's doable. Probably we could do better to make it more streamlined. Um, data compatibility remains a big challenge in healthcare because it's so fragmented. Um, in terms of clinical trials, we have a lot of you know pharmaceutical clients. You know, we're very proud and enjoy working with pharma. We're in several multi-center international clinical trials with our devices. You know, COVID-19 in some ways has pushed the acceleration of decentralized virtual clinical trials. And guess what? Sensors are a big part of that, right? The FDA mm -hmm. likes to see that objective data. You know, I think, you know, we need to go away from physician grading scales as much as we can, you know, because of its lack of, uh, you know, objectiveness, lack of sensitivity. So I think sensors play a big role in, in clinical trials and, and how that's utilized. And, and that's also another challenge of itself around data the security, validity, mm -hmm. measuring what matters. So we we also are very active in that space. I think it's a growing and exciting space to be. And ultimately, you know, we, we want devices out there, drugs out there that are better for patients, right? right. And, and that opportunity is really, really the key there. And well, what about, um, you know, use in like the neonatal population? I guess, you know, you focus in um, you know, as a professor of, uh, you know, pediatrics and you do work in the neonatal setting. What's your experience with you know, these other groups, not your traditional research groups, you know, people, the neonates, as well as people with intellectual disabilities, what's, you know, have your, have devices been tested in that, those populations? Uh, absolutely. I think it's a fantastic question. I, I kind of make a controversial statement is that like, I would love wearables to dive more deeply into populations that are not healthy, normal adults or outpatient cardiology. <laughs> you know, and I think that like those areas are really important, right? Like ECG monitoring, atrial fib. I mean, the reimbursements there, the, the markets there for sure. But like the populations like women's health, we've done more than 4,000 pregnant women in some of the poorest countries in the world with Gates Foundation. We've done more than 250 critically ill newborns and children down to the 28 weeks gestational age. We've done older adults, you know, more than 100 with dementia and Parkinson's. Those groups, you know, we need to innovate there. And then I would argue that the Delta opportunity for wearables to make a difference for them is higher, right? Because, you know, for healthy adults or ECG monitoring, there are solutions there. Um, I would say that these populations, even though you're maybe measuring things like heart rate, respiratory rate, they're profoundly different. The analytics, the skin tolerance, um, the clinical use case. So you really have to go in there and really discover and, and understand that. We, we published a pair of papers, one in more than 500 pregnant women in, in PNAS just a few months ago, and then more than 100 neonates a year ago in Nature Medicine. So I, I think these things are really important because it's not just the sensor, which, which is different, but it's the onboard analytics, it's the algorithms, it's the clinical use case. So these populations maybe use the same device are profoundly different, have different needs, and, and you have to adapt to that. Right. And uh, I have a question here that um, I, I was batting around in my mind as well, is what's the battery life for these devices? Because sure. sure. <laughs> that's sure. a practical, you know, if you're going to use them, how long can you use them? And there were a couple of questions about how long do they last? Can you reuse these devices? Yeah, sure, sure. I think one of the really unique things about our technology is our patches are rechargeable and reusable. That's actually really unique. Um, and that really is driven by the fact that we want to lower the per day per monitoring cost, right? So there are other patches out there, but mo almost all of them are, are only single use disposable. And, um, you know, it's cheaper, easier to make single use disposables. But we thought it was very important to make devices that you can own that are yours, right? What if your Fitbit was single use disposable? It would not be, you know, <laughs> kind of conducive to, to a business model. So that, that's one that's important. It's wirelessly recharged. We're very proud of our wireless, you know, power techniques. Um, in terms of battery life, we try to achieve best in class. So our Atom device actually goes up to about nine days. So we, we market it at seven. Um, the Annie Chesney is about seven days that we market it for five. And so these kind of long, long battery life is really really important for usability, right? Because battery recharging, these kind of things are our are, are burden, right? User burden. And we want to minimize that and try to achieve that once a week kind of thing where, where you can kind of, uh, you know, do it once a week and, and, and really not be something you have to remember every single day. So, so that, that's sort of like kind of my answer, like rechargeability matters for, for engagement and adoption and cost. 
and then um, you know long battery life to, to to reduce user burden. Those are kind of important features, and it's it's not as easy as it sounds, is what I'll say too. Okay. And so there was a follow up question on that uh, was how long do you have for a full recharge on one of your devices? A couple hours. A couple hours. Was and does does your do you actually also uh, recalibrate your devices? You know in the same way or how do you go about doing that so our devices don't need calibration when, okay. when you get them they, they don't need calibration um there are you know aspects we're looking at that may improve performance like for instance a, a calibration step for swallowing seems to benefit but not mm -hmm. required so it's an important question i think it really depends on the use case right if we're looking at swallowing and that's really essential for something like stroke monitoring you'll probably get the device set up with you and their first rehab you know visit and that's where a, a speech language pathologist can help you with that and then you know never have to worry about it but you know that user burden is a great question something we need to think about our perspective is the data matters, the quality matters, the clinical grade measurements that doctors can trust matters. And we'll sacrifice this step or that step to make sure that that is there um, rather than you know accelerated engagement or, or, or purchasing. I think these things are, are important to us. That's just a little bit different of our perspective. So we have one or two more minutes and I just wanna um, ask you um, what you feel are the hurdles in terms of getting FDA approval? And um, did you get your CPT codes before you did your trials or how did you go about that regulatory process? Yeah, I think for, I'll answer the CPT codes. I think CPT codes are, um, it's best to have an existing one that reimburses well. So that's, that's pretty much where <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I think there's unique ones that we might consider doing in the future. We know that that's a two, three, four year process and very expensive. But I think with the RPM, CPT codes, you know, certain things around sleep, you know, under hospital monitors, under DRG and operating expenses, you know, I think these devices are, you know, can serve a really fast foundational role. So it, it doesn't really require so much a, a new CBT code. Although some of the novel things that we're doing around early detection or swallowing, that very well may kind of be something that we seek our own CBT code. But we recognize that's a long path, like to use existing ones. That's what we've kind mm -hmm. of done as part of our strategy. Uh, in terms of the FDA, um, it is it is tough. You know, it is tough because I, I, I deeply respect the FDA. I studied the FDA as a medical student. <laughs> I published about the FDA, had a chance to work with a lot of just amazing, amazing public health servants at the FDA. I mean, dear, dear, dear gosh, they, they really protect us. I really, really believe that. I think it's one of the most important agencies in the whole world. And I, I don't envy the, the task that they have, right? They're the gold standard of regulation across the entire world for good reason. They have the best scientists, the best processes. Um, but, you know, technology, wearables, AI, machine learning, that's going way faster than regulatory science could possibly keep up, you know? And I think you add COVID-19 and the tremendous work burden low that is on the FDA to, to do things, you know, it creates kind of a perfect storm of challenges. You know, I, I think ultimately around software, I think the FDA is, is, is right that it's so hard to regulate software, regulate the companies that make software and try to trust them in that sense. You know, maybe look at Europe in some ways, some ways, I think overall the FDA, you know, is, and the, the, Europe is becoming more like the FDA rather than the other way around. You know, they've utilized notifying bodies to maybe look at things that are a little bit less, you know, risky. I, I know the FDA has third-party review groups to do that, but that, that that's sort of another angle. But, but I think when it comes to wearables, it's sort of a mix, right? Because it's hardware, there's safety, there's real possibilities for a bad wearable to create harm. I fully recognize that, Dr. Wong, right? Bad data, bad alerts, these kind of things. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer for you, except that I recognize <laughs> It's challenging. I think I right. recognize that conservatism and regulation is is better, right? Caution is the better side of valor in this context. I certainly don't want as a consumer or doctor for bad wearable digital technologies to just proliferate wildly, right? And, and lead to alarms and alerts. I think that can cause real harm. So um, don't have an answer. I'm glad I'm not wow. at the end of the <laughs> Thank you. But it's, a, it's a work in progress. Thank you so much for your presentation and for this discussion.